Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, a delight for me to be back uh, in Singapore in this Olympic week. This is, after all, the city in which London won uh, the Olympics, uh, defeating Paris by, I think, uh, four votes. Our redoubtable mayor, Boris Johnson, didn't let Paris forget that. In 2008, at the um, handover ceremony in Beijing, he uh, congratulated China on a fantastic Olympic Games and for having won gold medals in so many disciplines including ping pong. And Boris Johnson took the opportunity to remind the Chinese and others that, of course, ping pong was invented uh, in England in the 19th century on dining tables in stately homes where it was called whiff waff. And he took, as the English tend to do, a shot at the French right there. And he said, when the French looked at a dining table, they perceived an opportunity to have dinner. When the British looked at a dining table, they saw the opportunity to create an Olympic sport. <laughs> and uh, I think we're doing uh, all right, having at least won one or two medals by the second day. The City of London won the Olympics. The IISS won the Fullerton Lecture Series, so we're very proud to be in this fantastic uh, hotel for the fourth time now, having received uh, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, UK Foreign Secretary uh, William Haig, US Ambassador to Afghanistan Carl Eikenberry on the 21st of August, we're uh, receiving Klaus Regling of the European Financial Stability uh, Facility. But it's a real pleasure to have today with us uh, Robert Zellick, uh, who is uh, doing a tour of his own. The Tour de France has 20 stages. The Tour of the ISS has three stages. It started in London on the 25th of this month on his birthday with the Alistair Buchan Lecture, where he addressed us on economics and security. The second phase was in Mumbai two days ago, and the third and completing phase is here uh, in Singapore. As you know, Bob Zellick has been uh, counselor at the U.S. State Department. U.S. Trade Representative, Vice Chairman of Goldman Sachs, Deputy U.S. Secretary of State, and up until a few weeks ago, President of the World Bank. He's brought to these public and private positions uh, a tremendous international uh, perspective, and to his private sector jobs, uh, a really subtle understanding of how government works. Whenever I see him, he is carrying at least three uh, very fat books that he is reading, uh, bringing to all his work, uh, an intellectual hinterland that is really acres uh, deep. So it's a pleasure hosting him for this conversation. I will ask him a few questions uh, uh, to kick off the conversation, and then I'll open up to all of you, and I hope you all have um, very important uh, questions to ask. In uh, London, uh, Bob gave a, a speech on economics and uh, security, and noted the increasing need in today's world to uh, integrate uh, economic um, and security policy. So perhaps, Bob, just to kick off on this general theme, you might give us a sense on how you think governments need more effectively to integrate their approach to economic and security challenges. Well, John, let me start by uh, thanking you and IISS for the invitation. It's always wonderful to have an opportunity uh, to be back in Singapore, a country I've visited many times and uh, negotiated an FTA with, so I have very fond feelings, and I appreciate the opportunity to be back here. Um, my career has been a little different than some in U.S. foreign policy, in part because I came up as much on the economic side as the security side. So this is a topic that's always interested me. In some ways, I think the connection between economics and security is more assumed than analyzed. Um, centuries ago, uh, it was uh, the tenants were probably uh, territory, uh, people, resources were sort of the driving forces that connected uh, economic strength and, and uh, security influence. Uh, 
in the U.S. experience, uh, in our coming from our revolutionary period, Alexander Hamilton was one of the first to recognize that credit and commercial basis uh, was a fundamental uh, source of strengths of societies. And um, William Pitt the Younger put this to good use, ironically, after our revolution when Britain's credit was significantly weakened and he rebuilt Britain's credit, which in my view enabled Britain to fight a 20-year war against Napoleon and finance itself uh, in a way that Napoleon couldn't, who was more of a cash basis uh, uh, taxpayer, I guess. And, and, uh, and so I think that uh, over time, what's been interesting is to see kind of how these connections either are perceived or not. And people obviously perceive the breakdown in the 20s and the 30s uh, as le and, and economies and the international economy leading to political and eventually security difficulties. One of the things that I tried to highlight in this Buchan lecture was that I think that with the Cold War, Somewhat ironically, the perception of economics became more of a handmaiden to sort of a national security paradigm. Um, and the discussions will often focus more on economics of defense industry or sanctions <laughs> policy, still a very alert topic. But if you actually look at the late 20th century, I believe that events such as uh, Ronald Reagan and to a degree Margaret Thatcher's sort of revival of capitalism after the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system in the 70s, the oil shocks, became very important with the success in the Cold War. Because if you actually look at the Soviet Union, you see that it actually didn't have the flexibility and dynamism as an economy. And when oil hit $15 a barrel, uh, it couldn't adapt. And it couldn't adapt to information technology and other changes. So I think this perception of seeing economics not only as an input to national security, but as a powerful source of change itself, is something that people intuit, but perhaps haven't fully incorporated in their thinking. Now, East Asia is a wonderful place to see this, because you can see the dynamism over the past decades. And I think part of it is not just a question of resources to translate to power, but how dynamism helps societies adapt. And as circumstances change, you need societies that can adjust. So to bring this up to the present, um, I've been quoting Bob Carr, the foreign minister of Australia, who came to Washington a few months ago and said something that stuck with me, which was that uh, the United States is one budget deal away from restoring its global preeminence. And I thought this is a very powerful point, because as I look at the international economy today or security issues, there are many challenges. But Europe is stuck in a very difficult situation. At best, we'll be muddling through for years. Japan, in some ways, is a shrinking society. So the US is the one major advanced economy that can play a role with the emerging economies in reshaping the system. But at the heart, it has to get its own uh, credit and budget situation, as Alexander Hamilton counseled 200 years ago, but do it in a way that, that builds a pro-growth uh, uh, society. And in a way, for people here who, of course, watch the United States, in some ways it's almost inherent in the United States identity, in that it's hard to imagine uh, a United States uh, that is, if it's not dynamic at home, it's not going to be able to play the role abroad. We'll come back to the United States a bit later, but you used this very uh, celebrated British phrase about muddling through and said that Europe was now muddling through its crises. And I wonder whether you genuinely think that in this very fast-paced world, muddling through is the pace that is uh, required to meet uh, the European challenges. You had a seat at many of the relevant tables in which the current Euro crisis was being uh, debated. Angela Merkel, Chancellor of Germany, recently said that Germany was in a race against the markets and Europe was in a race against the markets to establish the fiscal union that was necessary uh, to give confidence that the euro could be an optimal sing single currency area. Do you think Europe can win that race, given the pace at which the markets are commenting on affairs? Well, time will tell. Um, and uh, I, I think to be fair to Europeans, it's not a simple problem to, to solve. You've got really three pieces of the problem. You have a sovereign debt issue. Uh, you have a banking issue, and those two are integrally related because many of the banks hold the sovereign debt. And you also have a competitiveness issue. And when I've discussed this with European colleagues, uh, 
I think they justifiably point with some frustration to say, if you look at the past couple years and how far Europe has moved on governance and support structures as a European Union, um, it's been hugely significant. The question is, is it far enough and fast enough given the challenges of the market? And I think Greece is its own unique issue, mainly because if it breaks and is unable to stay within the Eurozone, the main risk is a contagion effect to the others. I've been focusing most on Spain and Italy. And I really think, again, there's three core questions. One, the Germans are half right. Spain and Italy have to make fiscal reforms. They have to also make structural reforms for their competitiveness. But second, there's a mismatch between the time that those reforms will show the benefits and the financing. And so the challenge is, can the interest rates that they have to pay on the debt that they roll over issue be manageable? And there are various ways in which uh, the European Union could intervene. You had one that was suggested last week with Mario Draghi. We'll see how that's followed through. Um, but if they do not have the financing ability to make the reforms, well, then markets will, will test. And, uh, and if there's not support from the institutions of the European Union, then they won't have time to have the reforms take hold. And the third piece is the banking system, which again is related. You have to get capital into the banks. Uh, and if you do, then I think the ECB will support it. You mentioned Chancellor Merkel. I think one of the aspects that I think adds a complication is having worked closely with Germany over the years, I really have no doubt that Chancellor Merkel and Finance Minister Schäuble mean what they say when they say that you know, they will do what it takes to save the Eurozone. But I'm somewhat concerned that their room for maneuver may be narrowing. Uh, the German Constitutional Court has acted in ways that restrict the executive's authority. It's delayed the decision now on the ESM mechanism till September. And I think this is where the politics and the economics also intersect you're getting an increasing sense among Germans who, by and large, are deeply committed to Europe, more than most, I think, Americans recognize. But as they feel that they're paying more and more, and they're being criticized more and more, there's a sense of frustration that builds up among the German public. So I think what I'm watching closely is whether you get events where the governance processes don't move fast enough, or you get a miscalculation where markets uh, take an action and people can't uh, counter it, this is where the ECB plays a key role. And so I think you know, this week, again, people will be waiting to see you know, how far, what, what does the ECB mean with the strong statements? Um, bringing us back to the economics and security theme, the U.S. economist Martin Feldstein very famously wrote an article on foreign affairs some years ago uh, when as most economists, he was skeptical that Europe really represented an optimal single currency area and thought that it would lead to, to conflict. He never actually said war, he said conflict. But insofar as there's so many tensions now, not only as between the Euro 17, but the, the 10 who were out of the 17, just as uh, an observer of European affairs, don't you think that the ultimate outcome of this will have to be some new constitutional order in Europe in which there are numerous concentric circles and some people at the core of an economic union that is smaller and some people in outer core that is more uh, relaxed. Is that a future that uh, uh, Americans uh, perceive as one that they could also work with if it emerged? Well, first, you know, and this is true whether you're dealing with the US, Japan, China, Singapore, Europe, the decisions have to be made by the Europeans. If you look at Europe's wealth, if you look at its productive potential, if you look at its overall internal fiscal balance, these should be manageable problems. But the question is whether the governance structures to share the mobility of people, to have an internal balance, an internal current account, whether they will take those actions. One possibility is the one that you uh, suggest with your comments. Um, I think the reason why the Greek situation, which is only 2% of the EU GDP is important, is that it might have a signal of whether this is an outlier that will move out of the system or whether this could be a signal of what risks pose for other euros. And so what you see, and I think this is of concern, is you're starting to see a renationalization of markets. Mm -hmm. So financiers that can't look at the eurozone as one eurozone, they have to have their assets and liabilities matched by countries. So 
when I step back from it, and in, in the bigger picture, um, to me, since you asked about the United States, the striking thing is, is that, again, from recent history perspective, uh, after the uh, World War II and the reconstruction of Europe and Japan, you've really had a trilateral system where the United States, Japan, and Europe played sort of the key role of designing it. And I think we're moving out of that. So I think under the best of scenarios, Europe will be preoccupied. It'll be struggling with these governance questions, whether it will create a different structure, either more united or uh, of, of sort of concentric circles. These are questions I don't think anybody can answer, but what it does suggest from a global perspective is that Europe's international engagement is likely to be less than we've seen in the past. We've already seen Japan's influence shrink. And so this creates a very different international environment than we saw over the past 20 or 30 years. Now, when Europeans um, and Americans look to grow their economies, they look to do whatever they can at home, but they look also to what is now styled not the emerging markets, but the high growth uh, markets. And when the high growth markets look to grow, they look to grow internally, where they still potentially have a lot of room for growth, but they also presumably look to the other high growth markets. Um, and clearly, South, South trade is the, the new big geoeconomic uh, trend, the high growth markets trading with each other. And that South South tendency has been partly confirmed by the BRIC summits and the interest that the uh, Latin Americans have with the Asians, with the other emerging markets. But I perceive that these high growth market roads are unpaved, they're bumpy, accidents can happen. If you look, for example, at the relation between Brazil and, and China, despite themselves convening at BRICS summits, there's a lot of tension between these two high growth uh, superpowers. How do you think that high growth trade between the South-South countries will emerge and how will the sort of traffic lights be set so that that won't create the kinds of uh, um, crises of protectionism that one now perceives as often. Well, this is a wonderful example of where the types of geo geoeconomics that you've been doing at IISS and I've been trying to think about fit with the strategic context um, because um, that you have different changes going on at the same time. So one that's quite important is for many of the successful emerging markets, they've been based on an export growth strategy to advanced markets. But if you just consider what I suggested about Japan and, and, uh, and Europe and to a degree the United States, that's not likely to be your predominant growth model. So many countries are having to think about shift to domestic demand. This was the basis for some of the discussions the World Bank had with China. But it's true if you're Brazil or Indonesia or the Philippines, you may have a different mix. You may have more investment than sort of the consumption side in China. But this is going to lead to structural shifts in these countries. But second, what you pointed out in the South-South uh, exchange is very important, and it's far beyond trade. You can see it in investment statistics. You see it in remittances. You see it in tourism. I mean, look at Singapore here, which you're, which you're seeing come from the region. And um, this creates, as you suggest, both risks but also opportunities. Because by and large, for example, some of the logistics chains are not, and supply chains are not as well developed um, outside, say, the commodities area, which is, again, the source of boom for Latin America with China. But these can be improved. You can actually uh, deepen the networks. You can improve the efficiencies. If you look at South-South trade patterns, the barriers between developing countries are still relatively higher than between mm -hmm. developing and developed countries. So that also creates an opportunity in terms of formal trade barriers. Um, if you think of how investment can be linked to the supply chains, even some of the investment from China, whether it be in some of the low-wage manufacturing in Southeast Asia or even Africa, if it moves up the value-added chain. So as an optimist by nature, I would say all these prevent growth opportunities in what I've described as multiple poles of growth. But where your geostrategic and economic uh, point comes into connection is we've had an international system, a structure of rules, customs, norms, expectations that wasn't designed for that. And so the question is, how will we negotiate and shape it, particularly when the traditional leaders of the system have now kind of moved to the side stage, except, and I think this is why the U.S. role remains critically important, the U.S. could play a key role in helping shape such a system. Well, uh, 
Let me just uh, ask then that obvious governance question, since you have been at the pre president of the World Bank and you were president when there were debates about who should run the IMF, and of course a lot of people now argue that representatives of the new high growth economies should have their governance, ro uh, 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 go go governance rules. But one sometimes gets the sense, sitting in the West, that uh, the rising powers are rising, they're getting to the top, but they're not quite certain what to do when they get there. And of course, in order to create global public goods, you have to have a sufficient strategic extroversion, not to think only about your national interest, but what is in the, the general public good as, uh, as well. Do you, did you see as president of the World Bank, as you were l talking to the leaders of these emerging nations, that they were beginning to get that extrovert culture that would allow them to contribute to public global governance? I think this is going to be one of the, if not the biggest issue for the next decade or decades. And actually, my experience starts before the World Bank because I was trade representative in 2001. And so I, it was quite coincidental through the role in trade and then as deputy secretary and briefly in the investment world and at the World Bank, I saw over an 11 or 12 year period a huge shift in terms of the balance uh, on issues, whether it be trade investment, environment, uh, I think increasingly security issues, mm -hmm. um, which you see in your Shangri-La dialogue. And so I think to one of the challenges is for the emerging powers, they feel a tension in the system. Number one, some of them recognize the system has benefited them, but they really weren't the creators of the system. And so the question is, should they buy into it and adjust it to their purpose? Second, many of those countries still have a lot of poor people. We were just in India. You know, about two-thirds of the people below $2 a day are living in so-called middle-income countries. So there's a tendency on the diplomatic side to hang on to what the trade people call special and differential treatment, the idea that you have kind of a shared set of responsibilities. And this I saw again and again across environmental trade, other negotiations. Um, my own sense is, is that um, I mean, to come to your core point, there is a willingness among some of these countries, some of the leaders, to share the role. I certainly saw this at the World Bank, where <clears throat> when we did the capital increase, we increased the contributions from some of the major emerging markets, and we got some of the middle-income countries to think of their role with the poor countries, as opposed to just a binary system, you start to have more multiple tiers of development. But it won't happen unless somebody makes it happen. I mean, and the danger in a time particularly of economic slowdown globally is that it drifts. The archetypical rising power is, of course, uh, China. Uh, you famously called on China to be a responsible stakeholder in uh, global affairs. China this autumn will go through a, a leadership transition that will be officially confirmed in March. What do you see as the, the challenges that this new Chinese leadership must grip both internally and and internationally on the geoeconomic, geostrategic fronts? Well, I think there's both economic and political challenges. And then, and on the starting point for the economic one, um, I think it was a very healthy sign that the Chinese encouraged the World Bank to work with them on this China 2030 report. Mm. Because the logic was that even though China had grown 10% a year for 30 years, that they recognized the structure of that growth model had to change. So what I see happening now in China is, you know, obviously China's had somewhat of a slowdown. China has the resources to be able to cope with that. But I think the internal debate in China is over how much to rely on the traditional tools, the credit expansion, some of the traditional investment, versus some who are saying, we also need to start to shift to a different structure of increasing consumption and changing the mixture of the service industries, changing the role of the financial sector. And you see the natural tension between people who want to use the tried and true and move fast and others see you need to make the switch. My own sense in the way that China's worked in the past is that um, you know, the new team will of course have to move gradually, but that I think you will see um, not a big bang approach, but you will see movement in these directions. I was struck how uh, Wen Jiabao not long ago was talking about bringing more 
private sector participation in the service sector, which is one area where you could improve productivity and others. That's not too far away from bringing in foreign direct investment in that area, which was the key to their manufacturing side. So if handled properly, this actually provides opportunities. So whether for Singapore, the US, or Europe, to move into those service sectors, to get cross-investment, to think about shared interest in energy efficiencies and water efficiencies. So I see, again, you know, an opportunity, but it, it's going to have to, it's not necessarily going to move on a smooth course. I think the other side of it, though, and I think all of us on the outside wonder about this, on the political side, you, you see that there's an increasing movement among Chinese that feel now that they've lived a better life economically, they want some other things. And so you see the demonstrations about pollution and some of the different approaches that Wang Yang took in Wukan and others about involving them in the society. And I personally think that this new team is highly attentive to that. Um, but, you know, it's still the devil will be in the details of the uh, adjustment process. Now, traditionally, one thinks of the United States, if I can put it this way, as the kind of swing geopolitical player. If it decides to intervene militarily or abstain to intervene militarily, it has a, a big geopolitical impact. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a swing oil producer. If it decides to increase or, or lower production, it makes a impact on, on, on oil price, demand, supply, the like. In a kind of negative sense, one might almost argue that, that China is the swing geoeconomic power. If it were to have a slump, the economies of so many countries around the world would suddenly uh, be very um, heavily influenced. Uh, Chile has 28% of its exports go to China. So if China is slowing down its copper purchases, it, it really has an impact on that e economy. Do you think that uh, China can continue to grow at the pace, not only to sustain its own economy and its not obligation to its own people, but to bring the world through this recession in a way that will uh, um, permit everybody else uh, still uh, to prosper? Will there be a, a hard landing, a soft landing, or no landing at all because the plane will still be going at the right altitude? Well. My own guess would be more of a soft landing. Um, as I suggested, I think China has the resources to be able to manage this. The question is getting the policy mix. Um, if you look at China as well as other developing countries, you always have to look at the unique circumstances. Inflation has been a deeply uh, felt concern in China going back decades in terms of the politics. So I think that there were one of the reasons you have the slowdown was that with the transition, they were concerned about having high inflation in the course of this year. So that led to some of the actions that lowered some of the growth pattern. I'm somewhat concerned globally about the food price issue and how this mm -hmm. could, uh, you know, the food prices as a part of the consumer basket in India are much higher than they are in the United States. So that has a, an effect. Um, so I think that, um, uh, Again, if China uh, adjusts the structure of its economy, one of the things, of course, that is different was 10 years ago with the demographics, China needed to create 20, 30 million jobs a year. That's no longer the case. You'll have more people leaving the Chinese labor force in five years than coming in. So it won't need to create low value added jobs. It'll need to create higher productivity, higher value added jobs. That presents opportunities. It also presents some possibilities for competition. So again, you know, I tend to come back to the idea to think that most of these create good possibilities for more growth and others, but the system has to work in a way that the major countries feel that they all benefit from it, otherwise they'll start to pull away. You said in London at your Alice to Buchan lecture that uh, the international identity of the United States depends on its economic yeah. dynamism. Without that economic dynamism, the very personality of the United States, not only domestically but internationally, changes. Let's spend a minute or two, therefore, on the U.S. condition. What do you think uh, are the prospects of the U.S. economy? Slightly disappointing last quarter, 1.5% uh, of growth. Uh, and how will this concern of the U.S. economy affect uh, the election that we'll have in November? Well, on the good side, um, you know, I'm sure many people in Singapore work closely with the U.S. economy. There's the traditional um, sort of innovation you see. So, for example, in the energy sector, uh, not only a combination with the, the, the gas fracking, but some of the horizontal oil, you could really transform uh, 
um, the U.S. whole energy import situation, not that you can achieve energy security, but it can certainly posture the economy differently and help the manufacturing sector. And so whether it's in that or some of the things in technology that come out of Silicon and Valley and others, it's still a country that, that um, fosters uh, sort of creative problem solving. However, I think what's happened is um, the combination of slowness in the global economy, um, uncertainty in the business sector about what's to come with fiscal cliff, your taxes, the overall economic environment. And then frankly, you know, whether some of this was inevitable, but the regulatory structure issues, energy and the environment, financial sector, healthcare sector, some of the National Labor Relations Board policies have basically created an environment where a lot of businesses want to pick up and get themselves off the, the floor, but they're going to be reluctant, I think, to have major expansions. They'll expand at the margin until these are resolved, which comes back to the core point that whoever is elected, I think that coming up with a pro-growth budgetary package, this is very doable. The numbers are very doable, but it's a question of working through the politics. And I try to say this in a nonpartisan way, just the way the U.S. Constitution works, the executive has to lead in that process. Mm -hmm. And so we have, uh, in a sense, a, a self-created semi-crisis um, that will come through this fiscal cliff because normally in the U.S. as in other democratic systems, if political leaders can maintain the status quo through inaction rather than taking tough political decisions, that will be what they do. In this case, they can't because, because of the way that they themselves have set up the policies. If they don't act, you get a big tax increase. If they don't act, you get over a trillion dollars of spending cuts for defense and non-defense. And you already see the defense industry sort of talking about laying off people. Um, you wouldn't get the appropriations for the uh, agencies. So at least I've been trying to work, and I've been encouraged by this, Republican and Democratic senators in particular have been trying to understand the elements of this so as to set up something in the lame duck session, the session after the elections, for either a reelected president or a new president to try to frame this as a package. And one part that I would add to it is that I think it's important that the U.S. not only do that at home, but combine it with a international economic strategy, whether on trade, whether deal with some of the challenges for the middle income countries, that leverages the revival at home with an international approach. In these last 25 minutes, and in a moment, I'll open up to all of you, so please prepare your questions. We've been talking about essentially uh, a much more differentiated world than we've had for the last uh, 40, 50 years, a world that is much more plural, that to a, a certain degree is a little bit more egalitarian, where power is distributed amongst countries and regions a bit more than it has been perhaps uh, in the last half century. How then should the United States present itself internationally and brand its international position? In the old days, it was very much, we are the leader of the, uh, of the free world. We are the ultimate uh, provider of global uh, public goods. In this more plural world, in this slightly more egalitarian world, is there any different way that effectively the United States should brand its international responsibility both to be consistent with its uh, current capabilities and to be responsive to an enduring American desire to be more than just a domestic player? Well, the problems have obviously waxed and waned over 60 or 70 years, but sometimes we have a little bit of a uh, historical myopia where we don't realize that, you know, it wasn't so halcyon and the 50s with uh, you know the Korean War, the 60s with the Vietnam War, the 70s with the breakdown of you know the Bretton Woods Exchange System and the oil shocks, and so I I think that when the United States has been most effective, it combines the uh, the environment at home to foster the innovation, to foster the self regeneration, to foster the productivity growth. Um, to include all its people, as, as many as they can in terms of a growth model, but then to work cooperatively with others, whether in alliance systems or whether in international economic systems. Now, the nature of that mix changes, and what this discussion to me suggests is, is that the United States will, of course, want to have very good relationships with Europe and Japan, 
but increasingly the challenge will be how do you integrate some of the other rising economies or regions into the system, whether it be with monetary affairs or trade affairs or logistic systems and other private sector systems. The United States, and people often miss this, is a more adaptable economy. So what is always unusual about the United States is that normally if you're the major power, you want to maintain the status quo. The United States, when it's at its best, is not a status quo country. It's a country that keeps fostering change. Sometimes that can be disruptive for people, but by and large, it goes to this point about economics and adaptation. So I think the challenge will be, um, how do you combine that economic and security mix? I think on the security side, it would probably come back more to the role that the U.S. has historically seen as a maritime power with relationships with Eurasia, not necessarily being at the heartland of sort of Asian sort of land conflicts, but ones that deal with the security system, whether it be in East Asia, Southeast Asia, the Gulf, and I think the increasingly important role of South Asia with India. We've so far um, had a, a fantastic range of issues. I hope we can raise eight or nine others or invite people to uh, reinforce questions that I didn't perhaps uh, ask as strongly and directly as I might. So uh, if you could raise your hand, if you'd like to take the floor, ask a question, the microphone will migrate to you, sir. If you could stand up and give us your name and affiliation of relevant in posing the question. The microphone will normally arrive on, so don't start turning it off when you get it. There you go. <laughs> Good afternoon, Your Excellency. My name is uh, Jiang Bo. I'm from the National University of Singapore Business School. I read with, read with great interest your article in the Financial Times, the G20 must look beyond Brenton Woods too. So in, in that article, you, you said that the G20 should consider employing gold as an inter international reference point of market expectations about inflation, deflation, and future currency values so that this package could get governments ahead of problems instead of reacting to economic, political, and social storms. So, I think that this is certain, given that the depagging of the, of the dollar, of the US dollar, would mean that the dollar no longer have the illusionary fixed value against other currencies. So, it, instead, it would float against other currencies causing dislocation in foreign trades and massive uncertainty for businessmen. So my question is that besides these standard textbook theories on, on, on gold as being the real money or, or, or the more democratic form of money, so what are some of the other concerns that you have in mind when you wrote this article? Can you please share with us? Thank you. <clears throat> what I was trying to do with that piece in a way is take the monetary system as a subset of what John and I were talking about and suggest how the monetary system needs to adjust with these changes in economic fundamentals. So obviously there was a lot of attention on gold and some people focused on it as a gold standard, which actually wasn't my point because if you see what I was actually talking about was how to make the flexible exchange rate system work first with the G7 countries and then with some of the emerging powers. But what I was suggesting about gold was that um, we're in an era where the monetary authorities are pursuing some very unusual policies. I'm not being critical of them. I think the pressure has been put on them, whether the ECB, as you saw again last week, or the Federal Reserve. But I think it's important that as we try to deal with today's problems, we be careful about planting the seeds of future problems. And so to give you a, an example, of, of an effect like gold. If you look at agricultural land prices in the US Midwest, they're now at real levels at the highest peaks that they were as in the, the late 70s. And I think this is a phenomenon that, you know, one of the things that Alan Greenspan and others struggled to deal with is they tried to deal with goods price inflation, but they really couldn't figure out how to manage asset price inflation. And so one of the signals that that would suggest from land prices, farm prices, is there's a lot of money sloshing around. And when money sloshes around, it has to go somewhere. Now, the leverage of those land prices in the Midwest isn't what it was in the 70s, that's a good thing. But the rental prices tend to reflect some rather uh, buoyant assumptions about crops and, uh, and, and the outlook. And so my suggestion is that you know, central bankers always detest this notion because they don't want anybody to question their wisdom. 
But what I'm suggesting is, is that in this monetary system with flexible exchange rates, and part of this was how to move China to uh, sort of move to a more open capital account and through the SDR, so I had different elements of this, it would seem prudent to look at various real asset prices as, as, as market signals. So the, the key difference was, is not seeing this as an operational tool with gold, but as an informational tool. And I understand all the issues related to gold used for jewelry and other markets. Um, so it's not simply a question of gold, but it's more an example of as the monetary system adapts to this new world economy, there should be a check on the central bankers. The gentleman in the aisle here, if you could stand up, and the microphone is coming to you just behind. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Iftikhar Chaudhary. I'm from the Institute of South Asian Studies. Uh, it has been an enormously uh, uh, stimulating uh, session, and I want to thank the both of you uh, for it. I have a question that pertains to the bank itself. Uh, uh, I've been involved with the United Nations for a while, and we know, uh, you know that we are making efforts to bring it in consonance with the current uh, politico-economic realities. Now, with the bank, I know that under your stewardship, there have been many changes. Uh, uh, we have uh, half our women uh, employees. Uh, uh, developing countries provide almost more than ha or nearly half the uh, staff. Uh, there's, for Sub-Saharan Africa, there has been an additional C uh, a chair on the board. Uh, but the question with regard to the presidency itself, do you foresee, Mr. Zelik, uh, at s at some point in time, uh, a change? from uh, the current linkage to a nationality to a more merit-based system that will widen the catchment area? Thanks. Um, well, if you phrase it this way, could I foresee it? Sure, um, and uh, it may very well happen. But uh, what I think is important is to put this in the context in two dimensions. One, which you kindly highlighted, is that sometimes people just look at the symbolic and they, it becomes dominant. I personally think the way that the bank needed to change was to treat developing countries as clients as opposed to objects of policy. That meant how we dealt with them in problem solving, the senior staff that we brought in, um, and a series of other elements trying to draw from the best of a world perspective. But I'm also enough of a hard-headed realist that I wanted to suggest to people that the international governance system, if it's going to change, uh, we need to understand that it would, should change fully. So for example, um, there has never been an American who's the head of the UN. There's never been an American who's the head of the WTO. There's never been an American who's the head of the IMF. There's never been an American ahead of any of the regional development banks. And so as someone who has tried to have the United States engage with the multilateral system. I just caution to be careful what you ask for. In other words, if the United States isn't going to head the World Bank, that's fine, but I, maybe I should go run the IMF. Um, so we open it up to others. Um, and it's quite interesting the way the question is sometimes posed, not the way you did, but some say, should there ever be another American or would, would you be the last American? Well, if it's open to all, I would presume that Americans would qualify. And I would just suggest from 30 years of diplomatic experience that the horse trading that occurs with these jobs is not, hopefully we have people of merit that are based on it, but believe you me, it's a sense, just as always in the case of international relations, of sort of power and trading. And I'll give you a good example from Europe. The head of the EBRD, Thomas Miro, uh, was one of the best regional banks heads. He was fantastic to work with. He was a member of the SPD and the Germans sacrificed him in a deal with the French that didn't hold and fortunately we've now got a very good British head of the EBRD. But if it were based on merit, he should have served a second term. So my point is uh, on this is that, again, from the US perspective, I actually think it's a good thing that the US bears the responsibility of having some of its nationals run some of these organizations. To me, whether it's the World Bank or others is less important, but since my purpose is to keep the U.S. engaged in the international system, please don't disqualify the U.S. from any of these, uh, from these uh, positions. And if you're going to change it, then be honest and change it for the whole system and allow the Americans to qualify for other organizations.
gentlemen in the front row here, please. If you stand up, then thank you very much indeed. Good morning, Mrs. Zolli. I'm uh, Professor Houston Kwa from the NTU and President of the Economic Society of Singapore. Um, I am interested in three issues of your personal views. One is the chairman and you talked a little bit about the EU and so on. I'm interested in where is it all this headed? You know, in countries around here, we are very edgy, we are very scared, and we want to know your personal view, where ultimately it will end, and is quantitative easing some solution to it? Paul Krugman talks about austerity drives not the solution. He writes many articles on this. What's your view on this? And thirdly, I can't help but ask you a question on environment, because I'm an environmental economist. Um, given all this financial crisis, global crisis, is there any role left for global warming, climate change? Are we still interested in it? Do you think it will be pushed back for another 10 years? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Well, let me switch the order a little bit. On your second one, um, I, I think Paul Krugman um, is representative of a group that puts the distinction between austerity and growth, and I think that's fundamentally a false choice. And uh, your Deputy Prime Minister Tharman made a point at one of the recent IMF meetings that I attended that I thought, in a sense, focused on the core issue, which is that um, what we tend to see is countries increase their debt levels. The effect of stimulus policy seems to lessen. And so what he was emphasizing, and frankly what I've tried to emphasize, is whatever policy you have on the fiscal and monetary side, you also need to combine it with the structural uh, policies to create the foundations for for future growth. So just as I had the monetary question, another point I could have asked is I think the monetary authorities have been put in a position that because others haven't done their job, people keep pushing the monetary authorities to the front. And in a way, this is unfair to the monetary authorities and it poses the types of dangers we mentioned. So um, I think that in the case of coming back to Europe, it's a question of being able to get the structural reforms, get the fiscal debt and, and deficits and credit under control, but obviously do it in a mutually supportive environment. And so coming back to your first question, um, I don't think anybody can tell you with precision. If I were to place a bet, I would say that um, I think that muddling through with slow growth that yeah, you may have Greece not stay in the Eurozone, but the Eurozone I don't believe will uh, break up or, uh, in, as, as a group, but the downside risks, the probabilities of downside risks are increasing for the reasons that I mentioned with John, which is that the risks of miscalculation and the governance not sort of keeping up with the process. And third, on the environmental issue, this actually fits well with the question about the UN. Um, I think, and it really goes to John's point too about, uh, in a sense, moving away from the old G77 politics of some of these issues to finding uh, sort of win-win ventures. Now, when I was at the World Bank, we did a lot on, on uh, both climate change and biodiversity. We were trying to be respectful of the UN system, but sometimes I was somewhat frustrated that the UN system tried to focus on sort of getting 500-page text with 195 countries, and frankly, it wasn't doing real things on the ground. And as a very practical example, and this, again, counters sort of the political uh, assumptions, Hank Paulson, a Republican Secretary of the Treasury, and me, a Republican who's at the World Bank, created climate investment funds, got $7 billion of contributions, which we leveraged to over $50 billion, did projects with over 45 countries. And so it was, while the world is still discussing the creation of a green fund, we've got one up and running, and, and it's working. And, and we brought in environmental groups in the process and civil society groups. Every developing country that would engage with it could see the benefits. There's still huge gains in energy efficiency. John and I were just in India. You, know, you have huge possibilities in many developing countries of cutting the energy bill, improving the environment, cutting CO2 gases by just removing wasteful energy subsidies. It's the, way, the energy subsidies actually, according to the OECD, are actually higher than the agricultural subsidies, which are also outrageous enough around the world, including in the US. So. Um, so I think that the question is, can you put together practical problem-solving efforts on these things? Um, I was, the last time I was in Singapore, we launched an oceans initiative, which was quite 
significant in setting the stage for some of the progress at the Rio summit. So to make it work, you this is where some of the multilateral institutions can be kind of a, a neutral ground to bring parties together to try to solve problems. But of course, it will require the advanced and the developing countries to see a shared approach to this. So see, for example, the Kyoto Agreement, I, I was involved with the first Rio Agreement when I was in the Bush 41 administration. I think the framework for climate change that set up was a pretty good framework. Kyoto was doomed to fail because it was going to ignore the role of developing countries. So then we get to the question of how much, you know, the special and differential responsibility. So I think one of the things that actually troubles me as someone who's been quite involved with environmental issues from Antarctica to tigers to biodiversity more broadly to others is sometimes the theologians of this field set it up so that it's, it's, it's a win-lose uh, situation and a zero-sum game and maybe they feel good when they make the, at the big political forums but they're not accomplishing what can be accomplished. Lady in the aisle here, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Lara Purmiam, and I am the UN delegate, UN Youth Delegate um, of the Republic of Korea, and I'm now working in the UN Women Singapore office. I want to pose a question from a fresh, you know, younger generation's point of view. Um, I do, because, because I myself fall under the category of youth, below 35 years old. I paid particular attention to your recent speech in, in California to the, to the students. And I remember you talked about how to observe, orient, and decide and act. And I, from my point of view, I do see a lot of highly educated students um, paying particular attention to the entire elephant, not only the foot, and being already part of you know, the current events and events, uh, current events and trend. However, no, it doesn't, doesn't matter how much we are how much we're prepared, how much we are highly educated, how much we are passionately engaged in current events if we don't see the environment encouraging us, meaning the unemployment rate is very gloomy from my point of view and, and mm -hmm. I'm sure everybody feels the same. So is there any particular views that you would like to tell us in, in a few words, if you will, to the younger generation out there who are highly educated, very much motivated, however, very much discouraged by what we see around the world. Thank you. That's a big question. <laughs> um, I guess I would first say, if you take the events that John and I talked about, it will be up to your generation to really determine the future course of these questions. And on the one hand, the potential is enormous. I mean, if you think about the world economy that I grew up in versus today, I think it's a tremendous uh, uh, evolution that we're now in a world of multiple poles of growth. You're from Korea. Korea is an example of an economy that 1950 was at the bottom. Now it's migrating to the top and playing a larger role in the international economy. And I realize it may be frustrating this year or next year, but eventually it'll be your generation um, that, that makes those decisions. I think at a more technical level, at the bank, one of the issues that we were trying to focus on was this question, and it varies by economy, of the particular dangers of youth on, youth on employment and sort of developing uh, the appropriate skills. Um, and uh, more particularly, in almost every economy advanced or developing that I encountered, there was an interest in the education, skills development, workforce connectivity. And I think there can be a lot that still can be done in that area. Um, for, and some of this is actually shifting models of, of how we approach this. So for example, the World Bank did a project with the Islamic Development Bank looking at uh, this E for E, education for employment. And we saw that, for example, in Malaysia, there was a much greater involvement in private sector firms in the skills development than in a place like Egypt. And I think that there's potential, again, to uh, to try to not look at education in the standard way it was looked at before, but connect it with the skills development. There are some interesting private sector universities that are now creating some of these uh, opportunities. So my first approach would be, as in the nature of most problems, let's try to look at what is failing in the current system and see what sort of incentives you can create either on the supply side or the demand side. And on the demand side, 
you know, one of the problems in some economies is, is that the, the limits that young people have are because the labor rules are set up for people who've had a job and they overly protect those people. Now, it's not so easy to change those, but you can see this in the case of Europe with a lot of, with, with, uh, the, you often have a multiple tier system and so if you get a long-term contract versus the short-term contracts. So all these things to me suggest that whether it's the problems we're dealing with now or the problems your generation will deal with, try to be analytically honest and just open up what have been the assumptions about a system and if need be, challenge them. And whether it be the role of private sector education, skills development, whether it be labor work rules or sort of union uh, arrangements, I'm not saying that's gonna be easily done, but if you, if, uh, perhaps to give you a slightly more encouraging note, I graduated from college in 1975. It was a recessionary period in the United States. It was a very difficult time. And you know, a lot of this still ends up being uh, the individual. If you apply yourself and find the opportunities, things will come back and the training and learning that you have, maybe at a lower pay that you want and others, I, I have no doubt if I've looked at the past 50 years and think about the next 50 years, there's gonna be huge needs and opportunities. The lady over here, please. Thank you. Yes? Oh, one other last point. Oh. Just to come on, because both of you mentioned this. The role of women in the workforce is also something where I think you're going to see increasing pressure for change. I mean, if you think about it from the most basic side, how can a country succeed if it ignores 50% of its human capital? Um, and uh, what we've seen, one of the things that the World Bank was trying to foster was this notion of gender equality as smart economics. Um, basically, we, we did a project, for example, in Ethiopia, where we worked with the government to put room on the land tiling for two names as opposed to one. And all of a sudden, women became co-owners of the land, and then they could get credit, they could get borrowing. But it's quite interesting, once you start to dig into this issue for advanced economies as well, there are, there are patterns about women in the workforce that if you create some flexibility, in some ways, it's gonna be the same challenge you have with aging demographics, because they may need more flexibility of how they work at home and, and go back and forth in the workforce. Where there will be a debate, is some people will wanna legislate those rules. Others will say, let's get the information out there and what you'll see is the better companies and institutions will realize I'm missing out on this talent pool. So I think another dimension that you'll see is the growing attention to the, uh, the role of women in the workforce. Yes, go ahead. Uh, good morning, um, I'm Sharon from Bloomberg News. I know you spoke earlier about the crisis in Europe and the ECB and the strong statements that have come from President Mario Draghi. But um, how, exact, uh, how exactly do you feel about those statements and do you think his new plan will be effective and that he will be able to convince um, other leaders to follow his lead? Thank you. A tempting question to try to move markets, which I will resist. Um, <laughs> uh, look, let me just say this. Uh, I've known Mario Draghi for a number of years. I have high respect for him. Um, I think he's trying to balance these different forces that we've talked about. And I would not underestimate his intellect or willpower <laughs> to be able to try to uh, support the system. But as this conversation suggested, the ECB can't do it alone. And it's gonna require the member states that, that have to make reforms. Remember, monetary policy fundamentally buys time. That's one of my other themes here, I guess. And so ultimately, it's gonna depend on the countries to make the reforms, and it's gonna depend on some of the northern tier countries that provide some of the support uh, as the countries uh, make the reforms. So I, I believe that Mario Draghi will do his part, but he's not the sole actor. And the last question from this gentleman, if you could stand up. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Raymond Kwok from uh, Kwok Group, LLP and VC.com. Mr. Zolik, uh, two related questions and a very quick one. The first one is that, um, can you share with us some of your thoughts whether there is a new innovative way of looking at governance, whether it's the uh, banking industry or any other industry, or even including the way that the country is being uh, regulated, etc. Uh, the second one is that as things getting more complex, uh, do you think that uh, there is a human element that whereby we have reached a certain limit uh, 
whereby in organization which is huge, that they, there is a room for uh, at least two CEO or two president, whereby you can actually uh, exchange views to make the, the world better. Thank you. Well, as for your first question, um, I've been thinking about a variation on the financial sector. I, I think that we're in a period where financial institutions in general, sort of banks in particular, are going to have to think through the business model um, in a way that learns the lessons from the crisis, also deals with some of the breakdowns in ethics and behavior uh, in culture. And they're doing this in a very difficult political uh, environment, uh, as well as a difficult economic environment. And I think that's actually a very quite interesting question. In other words, so I think that, you know, you will find certain CEOs and, and uh, chairman of companies steering uh, them in a different direction. But I think we're still sort of through that, uh, we'll be passing through that process. As for the, as for the governance, um, of, that's a very broad question, but I guess I would say that um, in general, um, I think you need a combination of responsibility, transparency, and accountability. And so whether for international organizations, for example, sometimes people always emphasize the participatory nature. Mm -hmm. But if they're ineffective, the League of Nations was very participatory. Every country had one vote, but it failed. So some of the challenges for UN organizations, multilateral institutions are how to get that combination of responsibility and accountability. And I tend to think transparency, while it's often a challenge for executives, makes for better institutions. We tried to apply that with, with the governments we work with too, is that uh, for all the resources or knowledge or skills or talent that institutions like the World Bank can bring to bear, it won't work unless the country owns it. And in this sense, we've even seen across the Middle East and North Africa, it's not just a question of an elite ownership. It's a question of a broader societal sense of ownership. So the good news is there's things that with uh, telephone and technology and other advances, you can start to increase social accountability, have people involved in villages and communities with the performance. That means they feel it's, uh, that they have an interest in it. They have buy-in in the process. They may complain, but you'll probably get better information loops. So I think ultimately you can't escape this notion, however you want to set up your political system, of responsibility, accountability, and, and some uh, aspect of, of transparency. And you'll probably see experiments uh, in different, uh, both countries and, and uh, companies over time. Um, and I add this in the case of China. I mean, so for example, um, uh, uh, the current head of the Central Organization Department, Liu Yongchao, who used to be the party secretary in um, uh, Nanjing, in Jiangsu province. When I went to visit him, he was doing, in a sense, polling for 360 degree reviews uh, for the party. And I think he's instituted some of that at the central level. So. You know, even in a system that is non-democratic, that you will figure out ways to try to engage your publics. And I think this will be a larger phenomenon. As for the idea of, of dual uh, structures, uh, some places have used that quite effectively. I mean, Goldman Sachs used to have sort of co-heads of various departments. Um, and I, I think this really does depend on the individuals and the culture. Uh, it's the same in the United States. There's been a little bit more movement in recent years to starting to separate chairman and CEOs. It's a similar sort of type of issue. And the reason I say culture and personalities is, is that, as in any system, people have to figure out how to bring their skills and insights to bear in a cooperative one as opposed to one that, that, that it creates conflicts. But I think, going back to your, the premise of your question, I think this is in some ways, as in any period of turmoil, a little bit of a revolutionary period. And so you'll find people experimenting and pressuring with some of these ideas. Some of them won't work, uh, but if you take the basic principles of being fair with your analysis and trying to be transparent and analyze the results, I hope we'll learn from them. In November this year, as all of you know, the US uh, presidential elections, uh, no matter what their outcome, there could only be two possible results of them. One is that in January 2013, the gentleman with whom we've uh, 
had the privilege of having this conversation will have an extremely important position in the public sector or he'll have an extremely important position in the private sector. <laughs> in either case, I very much hope that he continues the extraordinary relationship he's had with the double, double, double I, double S, but also the one that uh, he's had today uh, with uh, Singapore. Uh, I want to thank him very much for this three-country tour he's taken uh, for the ISS, for ending it so wonderfully here in Singapore, for, asking, for answering so many questions uh, so comprehensively and displaying so elegantly that intellectual hinterland to which I referred. Thank you, Bob Zellick. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks.